So, is this camera my dream come true? The design is much like the Pocket 2, though bigger and chunkier. The controls have been simplified, now having just a joystick and a record button which doubles as a power button. There still isn't a tripod socket on the bottom, but there's an adapter in the box that adds one, and I like that it has its own USB-C port on the back so you can mount the camera on a tripod and still connect external power. There's a built-in speaker for playback, and it's louder than I was expecting. Listen to that audio in the built-in speaker. And now when you turn it off, the gimbal locks in place, not just for a few seconds as on the Pocket 2, but indefinitely. The most obvious change, of course, is the display. It's so much bigger than on the Pocket 2, and so much brighter. By the end of the first day, it was painful to go back to the Pocket 2. Now I can actually see what I'm capturing, and what it can capture just got a lot more exciting, because... This is the sensor from the Pocket 2. Well, it's not actually the sensor, it's a paper representation, obviously. And this is the one in the Pocket 3. It's a bigger sensor with bigger pixels and that allows more photons to be captured over any given period of time. And that means the ISO can be lower, which in turn means less noise and better looking footage. Also, with this new sensor and the new lens, we can get shallower depth of field. And the footage it can capture is absolutely gorgeous. With everything set to default, the color science is really pleasing to me. Colors are vibrant but natural. Grasses and blue skies aren't oversaturated and the tone is well balanced. Not overly warm, not too cool. In rare situations, it can overexpose the image a bit and I needed to turn down the exposure compensation a couple of clicks. But most of the time, the auto exposure gets it spot on. Dynamic range is excellent. I'm standing here in the early morning shadow of a building and when I point it directly into the sun, the building stays well exposed and the sky doesn't get blown out. Again, pointing right at the sun, my face stays perfectly exposed. If you remember how badly the Pocket 1 struggled with this, you'll know why this is so impressive. At 4K 30 and 4K 60, the footage looks great and sometimes even rivals what I can capture with some of my larger cameras. I really could not be more pleased with the video footage. There's a beauty filter, which is pretty um, interesting. For those who want to get the most out of your footage, we now have Hybrid Log Gamma and D Log M. Having 10 bit color on this is pretty exciting. These color profiles give you a lot more power and flexibility when it comes to grading your footage. It can shoot in horizontal or portrait orientation and also square. This is a somewhat overlooked option, but it's useful because it gives you the flexibility to choose which part of the footage you want to frame in post while still keeping the resolution high enough. Of course, you can also take photos with this. And normally this is the part of the video where I'd make a joke about the idea of using a camera like this for photos, but actually it can take some pretty nice shots. What's strange though is that the most common aspect ratio for photos, 4x3, is missing. 
It can only take snaps in 16 by 9 or square. It'll come as no surprise that the Pocket 3 captures really stable footage thanks to its mechanical gimbal. The horizon is always perfectly level, and you'll never get any of the smudgy, blurry artifacts that you see on action cameras that's caused by digital stabilization. However, you will still get some vertical bobbing when walking, and so there are some situations in which an action camera will actually produce smoother footage. But the advantage swings quite dramatically back towards the Pocket 3 once it starts to get dark. And this is where the good old mechanical gimbal still can't be replaced or even rivaled by smartphones and action cameras. When I went to do my usual set of low light tests that I do with all the cameras I review, the Pocket 3 really almost shocked me. This location was much too easy, the camera wasn't even trying. So I went over to a darker spot which to my naked eyes was almost too dark to see what I was walking over. Now, to put this into perspective, here's the Pocket 2, which was already fantastic in low light. When you compare them side by side, you can see how big a difference there is. And here it is beside the Action 2, in the same location. I felt like that wasn't a good enough test, so I decided to go out to a level of darkness where I normally wouldn't take any small camera, because it's just too dark. And now, I'm comparing the Pocket 2 to the Pocket 3, with the Pocket 3 set to low light mode and the difference is enormous. It's like night vision. It's really quite unbelievable actually. It's much brighter than I can see with my naked eye. And finally, a low light, ultra low light comparison of the Pocket 2 and the Pocket 3. It is actually nighttime. The only light I've really got is the light from the moon and the light that's coming off the displays. Looking at the Pocket 2 screen, I don't see anything, I just see blackness. But the Pocket 3, even in this extreme, extreme low light, you can see my face. Unbelievable. Probably the most exciting upgrade for me is the slow motion. The Pocket 2 could only do 120 frames per second at 1080p, on the Pocket 3, we can do it at 4K, and it doesn't even crop in. Having 4K 120 on a camera with a built-in gimbal that fits in my back pocket is such a dream come true. Now I can get a shot like this with hardly any effort and without needing to put a mirrorless camera on a massive gimbal and play the game of which dies first, the battery or my shoulder. It can also do 240 frames per second, but only at 1080p, but it's still epic for YouTube videos. Instead of telling you what I think of the audio, I thought I'd just play some clips and let you hear it for yourself. So this is how it sounds, just out walking in the street, talking directly into the camera in selfie mode. Out on this lake, just talking quietly. I imagine I'm a vlogger, and I'm just quietly telling you about my day. This is an audio test in a quiet room, and this is my dog. How's your day going so far? It works with the new DJI wireless lav mic. I already have some good lav mics and for some reason it makes even my favourite mics sound terrible. This is an audio test of the Pocket 3 using the Comica Vimo C. And this is an audio test of the Pocket 3 with the Saramonic Blink Me B2. 
I still have nightmares about the tracking on the pocket too. I don't even think an ayahuasca ceremony could help me undo the trauma I suffered when I tried to rely on the Pocket 2's tracking. The good news is that the Pocket 3 writes some serious wrongs and most of the time it's quite reliable. It's much, much better now. However, in more challenging situations, it still has quite a high failure rate. Now I know this is a hard test, we have a person wearing dark clothes, walking behind tree trunks, with shadows everywhere. But it's not an impossible scenario because the Insta360 Flow handled this same test like an absolute champ. But what's important to know is that the Pocket 3 tracks vastly better than the Pocket 2. Recording at 4K30 with the screen turned on gets me about this many minutes. And a really nice little upgrade is that it can charge using power delivery. So, super fast charging. The battery still isn't replaceable. I think that's all I really need to say about that. I'm still not a fan of the forced registration. The camera will let you turn it on five times before bricking itself until you sign up with DJI and agree to their terms and conditions. And I actually read their terms and conditions and pfft, dude. I'm also a bit troubled that if you're on Android, the app isn't on the Play Store for reasons of potential concern. You actually have to sideload the app by installing the APK directly from DJI's website. This means you don't get the relative safety you get with apps downloaded from the Play Store that have been vetted for security and privacy issues by Google. Autofocus is really good most of the time, but sometimes it misses and sometimes it hunts quite a bit. It's not often though. I also wish there was a setting for the focusing speed. It's very fast and I'd love to be able to do a slow focus pull from one object to another like I do with my mirrorless cameras. I think the tripod adapter is a bit too big. The tripod socket itself is tiny, so why do we need this to be so long? It's full of empty space, it sticks out of the case a lot, and when it's on a selfie stick, it makes the camera a bit wobbly. The case is still kind of weird. It doesn't protect the camera all that well because this whole side is exposed. I've waited for this camera for three years. It was my most anticipated release in the camera world. And at one point I thought it had been cancelled. But it's here and what an outstanding device this is. Going out into the world and using this over the past couple of weeks has been an absolute joy. I haven't enjoyed using a camera this much in ages. On the surface it might seem like just an expensive vlogging tool and it is great for that use. But it's capable of so much more than that. It's so good that I decided it's time for me to sell off some of my other cameras and gimbals because this can get me the same shots with much less work. In fact, none of my big cameras can even do 4K 120. Smartphones are getting so good now that they're trying to kill off cameras like this. And so, I'm not sure how many more iterations of the Pocket we're going to get. Someday, before too long, a camera like this one, this tiny, marvelous and ultra-capable underdog of the small camera world, might become a thing of the past. And when that day arrives, it'll be sad. But that day is not today. If you find this useful or interesting, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.